Good day, Denizens. Welcome to part four of our five-part series on World War II. Uh, in this um, edition, we uh, talk about um, basically the end of the war in Europe, um, and then um, including the D-Day invasion, uh, liberation of Paris and Rome, um, but then also, uh, sadly, um, the Holocaust and how um, you know, it's discovered uh, what was going on there um, with what the Nazis refer to as the final solution. Um, and finally, with the end of uh, Germany and what they called VE Day, victory over uh, or victory in Europe, um, when the Nazis finally capitulate. Um, so, yeah, let's go. Okay, so remember, um, the Allies were pushing up through Italy. Uh, this was Churchill's idea to go up through Italy after um, conquering Northern Africa. Uh, but notice how long it takes to liberate Rome, right? You know, just before um, D-Day is going to occur. <clears throat> so Italy was a very difficult fight for the Allied forces. And that's why in the meantime, um, I guess that's not why, but in the meantime, you have Dwight David Eisenhower, who is now in charge of all Allied forces in Europe. And here he is briefing his troops uh, prior to the D-Day landing. So Eisenhower has a massive plan. Eisenhower's plan is to... Um, land tens of thousands um, of Allied troops uh, from Canada, Britain, and the United States on five separate beaches, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juneau, and Sword beaches um, in Normandy, Normandy, France. Now, this is going to take the Nazis by surprise. The Nazis were expecting this invasion to come up by um, Pas de Calais, which is further uh, to the northeast, up the well up uh, the beach there, <coughs> or well up the French um, coastline, I should say. Um, but nonetheless, this will be the largest amphibious, amphibious invasion uh, in world history, uh, and it is going to be a, a smashing success. Um, Eisenhower wasn't sure, though. He, he had actually written a, an apology letter that he was going to send out um, had the Nazis successfully repelled the invasion, um, because there's certainly no guarantee that these guys were going to you know, gain a beachhead, gain a foothold, and uh, push back the Nazis and be able to get Allied forces into Western Europe. So this is a huge, huge risk uh, that the Allies take and they pull off. Um, and it's called D-Day. Um, the first operation of any invasion, the first day, is called D-Day. Um, and this gives... Um, <clears throat> This gives uh, leaders, you know, some kind of reference point. For example, if you know the invasion is coming, um, you know, five five days from, you know, this day, you say it's D Day minus five, right? If, um, and then you can also keep track afterward. It's D Day plus seven, D Day plus eight, and so on, right? Um, so that's all basically designated day of an invasion. Uh, but typically, when we say D Day, we're referring to this invasion because it is the biggest D Day. Uh, in, in world history. And here you can see um, the, the beachhead that's established up there on the left. Um, you can see the barrage balloons, uh, there's, there's little blimp looking things uh, that's to uh, protect from um, any type of incoming aircraft that might try to strafe uh, the land with machine gun fire. Uh, you see some prisoners taken there, uh, German prisoners. Um, on the right, you see the craft that were used, the boats that were used to land troops. They were called Higgins craft, uh, Higgins landing crafts. Uh, they were actually produced down in um, Louisiana, uh, where actually today you can go to the World War II uh, museum, amazing museum down there uh, in New Orleans. And um, you know, this was just simply an amazing uh, thing for the Allies to pull off. And remember, you know, what precipitated this. Um, was, you know, the Allies, they need to get to Berlin <clears throat> before the Soviet Union gets to Berlin coming from the other side. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the heroism of these guys is, is just remarkable. And, um, for example, if you watch the movie Saving Private Ryan, that depicts one of the five beaches, Omaha Beach. And Omaha Beach had the worst resistance um, or the, the stiffest resistance from the Nazis uh, and thus the highest death toll. So it was the most difficult beach to take uh, in one of the American beaches. Um, but nonetheless, uh, these guys sacrificed a whole lot. And in the meantime... 
back in Germany, things are not going well. Um, here's a clip showing uh, Adolf Hitler in color uh, just prior to D-Day. Um, even prior to D-Day, things are not going well. Germany is being bombed day and night uh, by American and British <coughs> uh, aircraft pilots. Um, and, you know, you'll get the idea if you watch the, the clip here that, you know, Hitler just kind of pretends like oh, everything's going fine, you know, no issues here. Uh, but things are not going fine. Uh, Germany is in a lot of trouble um, as we roll into uh, 43 and, and most especially 44. Um, the writing is on the wall. And once D-Day occurs, now Germany is completely fighting a two front war. They are basically surrounded um, east, west and south as the Allied forces close in. Paris is liberated shortly after D-Day, so obviously the troops <clears throat> then keep moving down through France, and the move through France is also very difficult uh, because of the terrain. Uh, there's a lot of brush, uh, what they call these hedgerows, um, rows of hedges essentially, uh, where enemies can hide out. Um, luckily, though, uh, what helped with the D-Day landings were the Free French, the French Resistance, um, you know, the, the kind of underground uh, resistance fighters who had resisted the Nazi occupation, um, you know, since since it began back in 1940. And there you see Charles de Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, <clears throat> who had been leading the resistance remotely from um, Britain, London. Uh, he comes back to Paris, uh, becomes triumphant. He later becomes president of uh, France. U.S. troops now marching through Paris, um, as opposed to four years ago when we saw uh, the French reactions to the Nazis marching in Paris. And something else that went down, too. So whenever French resistance fighters found out that you that uh, some French citizens were collaborating with the Nazis, in other words, working with the Nazis, working with the enemy, uh, they, they would punish those people, men, women alike. Um, you, you could be executed. Um, or in this case, this woman is having her head shaved. Uh, so when she goes out in public, um, you know, people will know that her head was shaved because she was helping the Nazis in, in some manner, um, and thus, you know, kind of a traitor uh, to her own country. And kind of out of nowhere, Hitler last launches one last ditch offensive. That's called the Battle of the Bulge. And it's called the Battle of the Bulge because basically Nazi troops are able to push out of Germany and deep into <clears throat> um, well the territory you see here, uh, the Ardennes Forest, which is on that border, um, you know, hugging in between Luxembourg and Belgium and, and even into France. And uh, this is a very difficult fight. And um, the Nazis actually are almost successful. Had they broken through at the Battle of the Bulge, it definitely would have prolonged the war um, and, and could have erased many of the uh, – much of the progress that had been made after D-Day, um, but some heroic fighting by Allied soldiers, some great leadership from uh, people like George Patton um, are able to defeat the Nazis. But then on top of all that, the Nazis, you know, they're just, they're beleaguered, they're done, uh, they're out of fuel, uh, out of ammo, uh, and, and the end is near for the Nazis. Uh, as we roll into January of 45, you know, this is Hitler's last chance at an offensive. Now Germany will be entirely on defense. <clears throat> And in February of 45, there's a very important conference uh, amongst the big three, uh, Churchill, FDR, and Stalin, as you see left to right down there. Uh, they had met a couple times before, um, Tehran, Casablanca, but this meeting is arguably the most important one, and it occurs in, in Yalta, uh, which is a, a resort area um, on the Crimean Peninsula. That's that little chunk of land that um, jut, juts out into uh, the Black Sea, Northern Black Sea. <clears throat> and basically, when the big three meet, um, they, they make some major agreements. Basically, Stalin promises that he's going to get into the Pacific War. Um, FDR and Churchill, <clears throat> you know, Stalin is paranoid, <laughs> of course, um, but also, you know, he's very concerned about a resurgent Germany. Um, that, you know, after this war, well, what if Germany does the same thing they did after World War One and they start rearming again and building up their forces? And, you know, what a lot of people may not realize is that the Soviet Union loses more civilians and troops in this war than any other country fighting in this war. And, um, and you know, 
arguably more territory too, I guess you could say, though it doesn't lose its whole country like, say, France did. But nonetheless, <clears throat> Stalin wants some promises after the war that he's going to have a secure border, secure frontier. So basically FDR and Churchill, uh, to gain Stalin's favor, kind of give in to this and allow Stalin to have these quote-unquote spheres of influence, which basically means that Stalin and Soviet Union is basically going to take control of Eastern Europe. Because after this war, what's going to happen is Germany is going to be divided and occupied. It's going to be occupied um, and divided into quadrants um, with the British, French, Americans, and Soviets occupying um, one each of those, co of those um, quadrants. Now, Churchill, he's thinking that, you know, he wants a strong Germany because he's worried about the Red Army and Stalin. Um, FDR is kind of this, this kind of middleman in this case. Uh, FDR is ready for the war to be done. Um, and, you know, both of these guys really kind of concede to Stalin and, you know, perhaps lay the foundation uh, for what becomes the Cold War and the Soviet um, really brutal occupation of Eastern Europe. So the Yalta Conference, um, a lot of historians argue, and, and rightfully so, that is basically the start of the Cold War because Stalin is going to gain control of Eastern Europe um, <clears throat> and eventually we'll have the so-called Iron Curtain and so on, which we talk about later. Um, FDR at this meeting also is finally calling for a United Nations. Uh, he had you know, hinted at this way back during the Atlantic Charter before the US had gotten into the war. Uh, but now, you know, specifically saying, OK, we're going to have an international organization. And it's at this point where, you know, all three of these countries, they are at their peak of cooperation um, where, you know, they are working together. Um, but, you know, there's also lots of spying, lots and lots of spying. And there are the big three in color. And looking at, you know, these pictures here, <clears throat> looking at these three um, you can see that FDR, uh, he is not looking healthy. He will be dead uh, within two months of this picture. Um, he will die actually uh, in Georgia uh, in Warm Springs um, and uh, before the war comes to an end in April. Meanwhile, good old Benito Mussolini um, is tracked down by his own people uh, along with his mistress and they are strung up with piano wire uh, beforehand, they were beaten to a bloody pulp. Uh, Mussolini's face is not looking healthy there. Um, so that is the end of Benito. Um, and in Italy, basically, is, is now liberated and free of fascist control. And there's a symbolic meeting uh, by April of 45. <clears throat> this is a couple of weeks after FDR has died. Um, but there's a symbolic meeting here. You see an American soldier and a Russian soldier embracing each other because they have met each other across the Elbe River, which is in Germany. So in other words, that would signify that, you know, Germany has been conquered from both sides, right? Uh, it's not completely over, but it's, it's just about done. Um, so this would symbolize that, you know, Germany has now been um, reached by both sides coming from, you know, the, uh, the other directions on each side of Germany. But one of the most unfortunate things that's discovered um, in the midst of the Allies um, going across Europe and defeating Nazi forces is they uncover something um, that is just uh, unspeakable. Um, they, they come across these death camps. And what comes out is that basically the Nazis had decided that these concentration camps uh, that they had been you know, throwing Jews and um, gypsies, homosexuals, non-whites, um, basically anyone that they did not approve of, even Jehovah's Witnesses, um, you know, Christians. So um, throwing them into these camps, well, what the Nazis decide, uh, they meet at a major conference in a suburb of Berlin called Wannsee. Um, in January of 1942. And at Wannsee, they decide upon what they refer to as the final solution, this kind of euphemistic term that they use, uh, which basically means that they are going to systematically murder uh, these people that they hold in these death camps um, to the tune of six and a half million uh, human beings, men, women, and children. Um, and, you know, these places are uncovered as Allied soldiers go across Europe and 
the allies just can't believe it. I, I mean, what they see, I, I mean, even strong guys like, like Eisenhower and Patton, um, they, they, when they see these camps, they're just beside themselves. They, they cannot believe uh, what the Nazis had been doing. Um, and running these death camps uh, was uh, really a guy named Heinrich Himmler, um, who was the head of the SS, <clears throat> the Schustafel, which were the elite of Nazi troops. Uh, but they were also responsible for carrying out the Holocaust directly. Um, and, you know, to the tune of, you know, six and a half million people killed, especially Jews, uh, well over six million Jews wiped out uh, in the midst of this. And just some of the harrowing images you see here uh, on the left of crematoria, what was decided was that um, essentially they would bring these people in on train or if they were already at concentration camps, start killing them. But um, children were typically automatically <clears throat> and, and the weak, the enfeebled, um, older people were automatically sent to, uh, to gas chambers um, where they would use Zyklon B gas. Um, they would put them into these, these rooms, release the gas, and um, you know, it looked like a shower in the room, but instead it just emitted this terrible gas that um, caused people to, to suffocate to death. And uh, then they proceeded to, uh, the Nazis proceeded then to take out the bodies and put them into these um, ovens that you see here, the crematoria. And one of the most famous or infamous um, should say of these um, death camps, of course, was Auschwitz. And Auschwitz, with the very famous sign there, Arbeit macht frei, uh, which means work will set you free or work makes you free. And the harrowing images here of you know those who had survived these death camps. And if you haven't been, you, you really need to go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., um, where as you finish, uh, you go across the, the, the rooms filled with the shoes. And it's just so heartbreaking and heart-wrenching. Uh, some of the other just terrible scenes from these camps, um, you know, the, the buckets of wedding rings uh, that the Nazis collected um, from people that they executed, um, gold fillings from teeth, uh, that they wanted to, to melt down to, to make profit. Um, lamps, lampshades made of human skin. I, I mean, just repulsive uh, what the Nazis did. On the 30th of April, 1945, with um, <laughs> tens of thousands of furious Red Army uh, Soviet soldiers um, storming in Berlin, um, Adolf Hitler is down in his bunker, um, and you know, toward the end of April here. Uh, so we're, you know, FDR has been gone now for over two weeks. Uh, so he doesn't live to see even Hitler uh, die or the end of World War II, sadly. But nonetheless, um, Hitler is down in his bunker. Uh, there you see him with uh, Eva Braun, his longtime girlfriend, um, who he actually marries finally. Um, she had wanted to marry him for some time. Blah blah blah. Um, the next day, though, they uh, each uh, commit suicide. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, you have all these angry Russian soldiers, very, very angry Russian soldiers, led by Georgi Zhukov. And um, they want one thing. They want Hitler's head. You know, they, they want to capture this guy and do God knows what. But um, instead, what happens, uh, you have to understand this bunker is deep below the ground uh, beneath the chancellery. Um, in the heart of Berlin, <clears throat> and there's, I don't know, there's probably 20, 30 people down there total. Uh, it's, it's a massive, it's a rather massive bunker by bunker standards. Um, and what goes down essentially is Hitler and Eva Braun go into a room. You see it there on the right, uh, sit on that couch. Um, Eva Braun bites down on a cyanide capsule um, to kill herself. Uh, cyanide just is, you know, automatic. Um, and Hitler apparently bit down on a cyanide capsule while also um, uh, shooting himself in the head, <clears throat> and, and uh, he's dead. Um, when the other people in the bunker hear the gunshots, they go into the room, they find the bodies. Uh, Hitler had actually written a, a last will. He asked that his body <clears throat> be uh, destroyed, be burned, uh, because he didn't want to be put on display um, like Mussolini was. Um, so basically... Um, they're taken up to the, the kind of backyard area that you see here. Um, 
the above ground and petrol is poured over the bodies and uh, they are basically cremated. Um, and, and that's it basically, um, with Hitler gone, um, you know, the, you can see over here on the right, uh, the soldiers coming down, I believe there's a red army soldiers coming down there trying to inspect the scene, um, to, you know, try to find Hitler's body. Um, but nonetheless, that's going to be it now for, uh, Nazi. Germany. Uh, Nazi Germany announces that Hitler actually died fighting in the streets in Berlin. <laughs> um, and, you know, Berlin was in terrible shape. Um, first of all, Russian soldiers were pretty much given carte blanche to do what they wanted in Berlin, um, which just led to some terrible atrocities. Tens of thousands of women raped, uh, people killed indiscriminately. Um, and, and Berlin just totally destroyed. Uh, if you look on the previous slide there, you'll see uh, color images of Berlin, I believe in July of 45. But nonetheless, uh, in Berlin, I mean, you basically had old men, um, like in their 70s, and kids, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, in charge of the defense of Berlin, basically. Um, and nonetheless, um, about a week after Hitler commits suicide, uh, on the 8th of May, 1945, um, the guy who is now in charge of Nazi Germany, Keitel, um, he finally signs the agreement to end the war uh, in VE Day, Victory Over Europe Day, is the 8th of May, 1945. Um, and that is it. Uh, the Europeans, the Allies have defeated the Nazis, but Japan still lurks.